Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you this free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a review of the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter f5 to 6.3 DN sports version lens for the Sony E mount as well as the <coughs> e mount alliance 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 which I don't know anybody who actually has the L mount and is actually using it right now, but Sigma is a part of that alliance. Now, before we get into the outside of the lens, as well as the sample images, I wanna tell you what I photographed, and I first took it out to the zoo. Anytime I get a massive zoom lens, I like to go out to the zoo to try and photograph the gorillas, the flamingos, the cheetahs, anything else, the, the, the cougars, and I mean the women, the older women that are out there, and potentially also photograph the eagles. Now, I got boned the first first time, not by a cougar, but by the eagles the first time I went out because they didn't sit where I needed them to sit. So I had to go back there, but that's when I broke out the 200 to 600 millimeter Sony version and I went back and the eagle was right where I needed it to be. But I also took it out to a Phillies game and thankfully I got to shoot in the end of the dugout in the photo hole and got down on the field, which is a great place to shoot. So now let's take a look at the physical attributes of this lens. It's a pretty big lens and it actually comes with this protective lens covery thing, which you can use if you don't use the lens cap. Take that, Steven. Uh, the lens cap is right in here. This is a 95 millimeter filter thread. So it's a 95 millimeter lens cap. This is the lens. It's pretty big and it has some heft to it, but it also has a new thing on the side here called the TSL or the LTS, I guess I got it backwards. L stands for lock, T stands for tight, and S stands for smooth, like Rob Thomas and Santana. So smooth. Steven probably looked like uh, Rob Thomas back in high school, but that's a different story. But check it out. This is what you get when you do smooth. This is what you get when you do tight. It's a little harder to turn. Also, you're not gonna get the focus, see, it's not just gonna, slip. It's not slipping like this, but if we go onto this, it does slip. So there's two ways that, uh, that Sigma says you can zoom it. You can turn it this way, or if you're a weird person, you can pull from here. I don't know anybody that pulls from here anymore when you could simply twist and turn right from here. As you can see, as I'm zooming, it's extending. It's not an internal zoom lens it means as you turn it it is protruding and zooming out and getting longer in this case this is the sony 200 to 600 but as i'm zooming nothing is changing nothing at all so we're going to get back to this in a few minutes because it's important to put it up against that lens now as we walk around the outside of the lens you've got different switches you've got your autofocus to manual your full to limit you've got your os for one and two optical stabilization and then you also have different custom setting buttons that you can have with c1 c2 as well as off i already talked about the lts switch you've got a couple of customizable buttons here and that is really it oh yeah also right here you have your manual focus ring if you're going to go ahead and manual focus it, but that's up to you. So holding this lens can get difficult because it weighs 4.6 pounds or 2,100 grams. Now that is heavy, but the prior sports version for the DSLR clocked in at one and a half pounds heavier. So I don't mean this as a joke or anything, but if you're gonna be shooting birds, or you're gonna be using this for a long amount of time, or you're someone who's smaller, you don't have a lot of strength in your arms, you're gonna to wanna to use a monopod because this will get heavy. I, on the other hand, was able to handhold it the entire baseball game, but as you zoom out and you're shooting at 600, you do get a little bit of shake because your arms, I mean, you're holding a big lens. So it does weigh quite a bit at 4.6 pounds. Now you might think that the Sony would weigh a lot more, but it doesn't. This one weighs in at 4.65 pounds or 2,115 grams. Now I don't have the Tamron 150 to 500 here, but that one is lighter than all of them and it's also a little bit shorter. That weighs in at 4.2 pounds. As you can see here, the Sony one is taller, 
The Sigma is shorter, which is good if you need to fit it into a bag, but also as you zoom it, it ends up becoming longer. You can see that. So I personally rather have the one where it's in internal zooming. Another difference is, watch this, I'm going to zoom from, 200, from 150 to 600. Yeah, it's an extra 50 millimeters, but look at the twist. I got to twist it like this. I got to like keep twisting in order to go from 150 to 600. Whereas on this Sony, I literally go from, where is it? Right here. I go from 200 to 600, 200 to 600 with just the twist of the knob right here. You can go through it much, much quicker. So that's a benefit here, but of course there's a price difference and we'll talk about that by the end of the video. So the first set of images that you're gonna see right here is when I went to the zoo. I timed it perfectly because as soon as I showed up, the gorillas just came out around 9.30, 9.45, which gives me a chance to zoom in to 600 millimeters and get stuff like this. So I'm zooming in at 600, I'm at 1 640th of a second, at 6.3, at 1600 ISO. Now keep in mind, if your shutter speed is to drop below 600 or 1 600th of a second or 1 640th, you might end up introducing some shake. But with a lot of the cameras today, you have image stabilization in the cameras as well as in the lenses, so you can get away with hand-holding at slower shutter speeds. Now, I use the Sony A1. That's what I use to do all of the sample images because that's my go-to camera right now. Most people are not going to have an A1. They may have the A6600, they may have a ZV-E10, they may have the A7 III or any other full-frame camera, even the A9 and the A9 II, but this is my choice for taking out into the real world right now. So let's zoom in on this at 600 millimeters. It looks super solid and it better at 6.3 when you're zoomed out all the way to the end. Keep in mind, the less light you have when you're at 6.3, like if it's darker out, you're gonna have to bump that ISO to compensate for that shutter speed. I like to keep the shutter speed up higher, even if that means I have to bump up the ISO and potentially introduce more noise and grain because I'd rather have the sharp image than to have some motion blur and some shake and then the image not be usable at all. And since we're on this right now, a lot of people ask, can I put a teleconverter on this lens? And the answer is yeah, you, you can. But you may not. Anybody get that reference? Barry Levinson from the movie. Oh yeah, Avalon. If you have never seen Avalon, I highly recommend it. You don't wanna put a teleconverter on a 6.3 lens. Then you're gonna be at F11. It's gonna slow the focusing down. You're gonna lose a lot of light. I have an entire video on why I don't like teleconverters. It is linked down below. Go give it a check. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the Sigma 150 to 600 and edited with Fropac 3. Let's start with Prestige Worldwide. Boom, one click and it looks Great, followed by November Rain, gives you a really interesting look. Then we've got King Contrast, which really boomifies and brings out that contrast. And then, if you wanna get creative, we've got one called Capone. But now I wanna show you one of my favorite presets from Fropac One called Skittles. With one click, boom, it looks great. All I need to do is pull back on the yellow, and now I think it's perfect. So if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide that they're for you, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna grab Skittles in Fropack 1, you can get the Fropack triple play bundle with Fropack 1, 2, and 3 at a special discounted price. Now, let's get back to the video. Next image, we got a cheetah at 181 millimeters. He looks good, he looks colorful, he looks nice and sharp. That's what we're looking for. Does it look sharp? How is the autofocus? We'll see that with baseball when we get there, because a lot of people are like, you only go to the zoo, that doesn't show us autofocus. Yeah, we'll get there. And then a cheetah at 600 millimeters. I mean, you don't even need a teleconverter when you have a 150 to 600 millimeters, because if you need more than 600 millimeters, you're just too far away. But also, if you throw this on a crop sensor camera, you're gonna get the equivalent of a 225 millimeter to 900 millimeter zoom. So if you want more bang for your buck, 
go ahead and throw it on something like a crop sensor camera. But keep in mind, the atmosphere starts to get in the way. If it's hazy, if it's hot, you're going to start getting the rippling of the heat waves and that's going to interfere with your focus and it's going to interfere with your sharpness. And it's not the lens's fault. It's just that things are at a super distance and it's going to cause some issues in your final images. Now, I love photographing flamingos. They're great color. They're just, then they sit where they, you know, they basically stay in one place. Well, at this point, the flamingos all had laid eggs and they're sitting on them. Any guesses to what's in those flamingo eggs, Steven? Baby flamingos. Baby flamingos. I just thought that was a cool shot. And there is one of the baby flamingos that already hatched. So he's got it. Yes, they're white when they're born. And then as they eat more of those shrimp in the water, they change color because they are what they eat. Like, I'm surprised I didn't turn into a peanut butter sandwich when I was a kid because all I ate was peanut butter. Now, like I said earlier, the first time I went out to photograph, the eagle was not anywhere to be seen close enough to give me good results that I was looking for. So I had to go back a second time, but that gave me a chance to get a 200 to 600 from Sony in and give you a side-by-side -side image. Before I show you that, this is where the eagle was sitting, really close. This is a wide angle. This is at 150 millimeters. But the reason I show you this is because the fence. Everybody always asks, why does the bokeh look so weird in the background? That's because there's a fence that looks just like this. And I'm shooting through this fence at 600 millimeters with both of these images. Can you tell which one is the Sigma and which one is the Sony? You've got one on the left, you've got one on the right. Can you tell the difference? Now, you probably can't tell the difference. The Sigma is on the left at 600 millimeters and the Sony is on the right at 600 millimeters. As we zoom in on the Sigma one, you can see how super duper sharp the eye is. Now, it's just sitting there and it's not like it's an extreme environment, but I just wanted to see at 600 millimeters, is it super sharp with the Sigma and is it super sharp with the Sony? And if they match, isn't that a bonus and a plus for the Sigma being that it's less expensive? Yeah, so keep that in mind that they do look very similar and you're gonna take that into consideration when you're deciding which one to purchase for you. But next, I was able to get a photo credential to go back down to the Phillies where earlier in the year, I had to shoot from the concourse and couldn't get into the dugout, the, uh, the photo holes at the end of the dugout. Uh, it's, it, it's a great place to shoot from and thankfully it was open again and I got to shoot from the third base side, which is perfect when you have a 150 to 600 millimeter lens because you can grab just about everything. This shot right here is from a walk-off home run. Now it's a right-handed batter, so I kind of wanted to wait for the follow-through because if I just get him swinging, I'm just going to get his back. But when he's done with the swing, you get the follow-through, which makes for a great image. And this was a walk-off home run basically to win the game in extra innings. Now this is full frame, no cropping. We're at 543 millimeters, which makes you question, would 600 be too much down there. Now there are photographers that use the 600 millimeter lenses. I mean, I love a 600 F4, but how versatile is that? Especially when you look at the next shot and you're like, oh snap, I have the entire team around home plate at a hundred. What am I at? I'm at 274 millimeters on this one. And if all I had was the 600 millimeter, I couldn't quickly change lenses to something else to get this around home plate. All I needed to do was pull back on the zoom and frame it like this and get this shot. Now, something's interesting here is we're focused right here on this bearded filly. And as you go across the image, it's not as tack sharp as I wanted it to be all the way across. But some of that probably has to do with where the players were and maybe the heat, because it was super humid that day, does the heat play a part in not allowing me to get super duper tack sharp images at a distance? That's something to keep in mind. Now this is all the way across the diamond. This was a play where the player was running the first base. You could see right here as we zoom in on the glove, it's just as the ball entered the glove. He ended up being safe at first base. Um, it doesn't look as super duper incredibly tack sharp as I would want it to be, but I am zooming in pretty far to see this. And then this is something that I've seen in mega zoom lenses that you're like, hmm, I thought that it would be slightly sharper all the way out, but it ends up that it's just slightly not super duper perfect if 
you are pixel peeping. Now the reason I showed you the picture of the Eagle is because that was at 600 millimeters and it's incredible and I'm filling the frame more and it looks great. Just like this image right here, this is what, 531 millimeters, you can see how tack sharp it is of the player on the bench. It's just great when you can fill the frame. So when you're filling the frame and the subject's pretty darn close, you get some great, great results. At a super distance, as you start to zoom in, you might see some imperfections. And honestly, I went back and looked at some of my older 200 to 600 Sony baseball photos and noticed something very similar at the end at 600 millimeters, very similar to what I'm seeing in this one. So I think it just has to do with shooting at a distance as you zoom in, you're gonna start to see some little imperfections. Now, speaking of differences, right before we made this video, you're able to focus within 23 inches of a subject with the 150 at 150 millimeters. Now, I tried to do the same thing with the Sony 200 to 600, and I had to be seven feet back at 200 millimeters for it to get in focus. So if you feel that a subject is gonna be getting closer within two, three feet of you, and you can be at 150 millimeters, it's gonna focus with this, where it's not gonna focus within anything closer than seven feet with the 200 to 600. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I use at jaredpolen.com and get a Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get a 14 day free trial. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. All right, so let's continue on with some more baseball photos. We've got the second baseman coming in to get a ball. He looks great. Look at the colors. I mean, of course, the A1 gives you some amazing colors, but I think you're gonna get amazing colors with just about any camera that you use when you shoot raw and you tweak your files. None of these images are cropped. I say that because a lot of sports photographers like to crop their images a ton, and I choose not to do that myself. I've talked about that plenty in the past. But even at 6.3 for this, you know what? The background is, Bryce Harper's blown out pretty much in the background. You can still see the numbers on the board and the scoreboard, but it, it you know, it is a distraction because if I put a 600 F4 next to this, you would see how the background would be even more obliterated. But in this case, it's not a super distraction. Play at second base, guy trying to steal the bag, he's sliding in and the ball goes off the end of the glove. He ends up being safe because he drops the ball. Filling the frame around the plate again, I'm just showing you some general baseball images that you can end up getting. You just gotta be prepared for the swing. Fill the frame as much as you can, leave room for the ball to come in, leave room for the players to shift because they get down low when they're about to swing. So you have to keep all that in mind when you're shooting. Now this looks nice and sharp on his face as he goes through with with his follow through. It's a nice shot. This next shot is Bryce Harper coming up to the plate. He is full frame, follow through. He did not hit a home run on this one. This is 526 millimeters. No cropping done to it. Filling the frame, I think it's basically a, a, a perfect frame right here. And you can see how the background, some of these people could be distracting. And that's the difference between shooting a 400 2.8 or a 600 F4, except you don't have that versatility. And sometimes, it's just amazing to have that versatility and maybe you're gonna get better images with a mega zoom 200 to 600, even though you may get more obliterated backgrounds with a 600 F4, you might be missing out on other shots unless you can quickly grab another body and maybe put a 70 to 200 on it. But even that, 70 is too wide for baseball and 200 is really not that far out. Moving on, I always love to focus on the pitcher. This one's at 600 millimeters just to show you what you can get. And the other one, right here is filling the frame pretty well at 363 millimeters. Now something to keep in mind, if you have an A1 and you put this on there, you're only gonna get around 15 or 16 frames per second, even when the camera can do 20 or 30. Now with the Sony, we tested it out and we got about 21 frames a second when we turned it into the 30 frames a second mode. So because it's not a G master lens, because not all lenses can take advantage of the 20 and 30 frames a second in this Sony, 
Sony A1, but then again, a lot of people aren't going to be shooting with the A1, but I'm just passing it along that it can still do 15 or 16 frames a second and keep up with it and still be in focus, so that's a good thing for the Sigma lens. Now, the next three images I'm going to show you were a little challenge that I gave myself during the game. I got tired of doing the motor driving and wanted to go old school and challenge myself to one shot. So I set the camera to one frame. I press the button, I get one shot, and here are those three images. This is the guy at the plate just a fraction of a second late, but you could see I got him fouling off the ball. So that's good for just one shot, not relying on the motor drive. The next is the pitcher, I think, in a perfect place for the shot. What are we at? We're at 600 millimeters here, and I think this is the perfect motion to capture the pitcher with just one shot and not relying on the motor drive. And the final one is a fraction of a second before the ball came in, but it is really cool to be able to do that. So I challenge any of you who want to just see what you're capable of doing, set it to one shot and see what you can capture and don't rely on the motor drive. Your anticipation will get so much better. Two more images. This image right here is what you get at 150 millimeters from where I was shooting. Now it looks like you're like, it looks more like a snapshot. That's because it's the F5. You're at F5 and almost everything looks like it's in focus. So this is where you want to go tighter. Like this would be the frame that you'd want to get at home plate. Because you could do that because you can zoom in with a lens just like this. So it's pretty cool that I got to run it through its paces at the zoo with animals that really weren't moving very fast, as well as baseball players who were running around the field. It's a great way to test out the autofocus capability of this lens, and I think that it did a fantastic job. But now let's talk about pricing. This lens comes in at $14.99. The Sony lens comes in at $19.99. And for comparison purposes, the Tamron 150 to 500 comes in at $100 less than the Sigma at $13.99. It's also smaller, it's lighter, it's more compact. So you have to take that into consideration when you are making a purchase. So if you're gonna go with a lens that's this big already with the Sigma, I don't think you're gonna run into too much of an issue if you take a lens that is this big right here. Now, before I tell you which one I would personally go with, let's do a sniff test followed by a wind tunnel test. Take me out to the balls game. Take me out with you guys. Smells like Cracker Jacks. That's right, Cracker Jacks, cause it's a one, a two, a three. Ah, ah, ah. Strikes you're out at the, anyway, let's do the wind tunnel test. Wow, completely fails the wind tunnel test because it blocked all of that air. At the end of the day, which one of these two would I personally go with? You've got a $2,000 lens, you have a $1,500 lens. For myself, I would purchase the Sony because if my camera is the Sony that I'm using, I wanna put the native one on there. But beyond that, the fact that the throw is 200, to 600 and it's really quick like that and it's internal zooming versus external zooming for the $500 extra for me it's worth the extra $500. But for the everyday shooter that's going to go out there and shoot birds who want to shoot nature who want to shoot sports you can't go wrong at 1500 bucks for this Sigma for the E mount or the L mount alliance. Save that $500 and invest it in another Sigma piece of glass or another lens that you wanted. That's what this is all about. You don't need to go with the Sony if this is good enough and this is plenty good enough. You saw the two raw files next to each other. You can download those raw files and pixel peep them to your heart's content. Are there gonna be slight differences Absolutely. Will most people ever notice them? Absolutely not. At the end of the day, this is a very solid offering. Good on Sigma for being able to chop off one and a half pounds between the old sport and the new sport for the digital native lens. So which one would you decide to go with? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.